My assigned topic was the perspective from headquarters, and being a good former headquarters guy, I ignored it because we don't listen to the centers. And uh, I said, <laughs> I'll talk about some personal reflections, Iselskip, Fife, and Boreas. I want to begin, this, I'm going to talk some prehistory, and, and I want to, if you don't know after all these years how NASA operates, it's really according to the, if you have a new hammer, everything looks like a nail, okay? <laughs> that is really behind a lot of NASA. And the early program in the Earth, the biosphere related activities, was really driven by this. NASA had a brand new tool, it was called Landsat. And they organized big programs to say how we're going to use this and how useful it is. And Forrest alluded to a, a minor program called Agristars Lacey that peaked out at $35 million a year. Uh, and they were trying to sell the usefulness of Landsat for studying the biosphere, uh, which those of you know very well at this point and was obvious to some of us early on that you're not sampling at the Nyquist frequency. You just can't do biosphere no matter what if you only get an image every 18 or 36 days or whatever it is. Well, anyhow. Okay, so some, some prehistory, and I guess I'm gonna have to walk over here where I can read it because that print's too small. Um, <laughs> ah, yes. I, I'm gonna go way back. I'm gonna go back to my seat and pull out a document. Um, <laughs> In 1977, NASA wrote a climate plan. Anybody ever hear of this? Anybody ever see this? Well, you're an old fart, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> this was written in 1977, and it's an amazing document. It was started by Istiak Rasul, and many of you know Istiak. Do you know, by the way, Istiak passed away in April, and, and I, I just learned that, I, and I, didn't, I was shocked. Istiak Rasul was the chief scientist at NASA headquarters, and uh, he organized and promoted this climate plan. It was executed by Goddard. <coughs> Istiak drew on the community he knew best, and it was chaired by Andy Ingersoll, who's a planetary scientist. And uh, I happened to be involved because I was actually supporting Francis Bretherton, who was at the National Academy o Committee overseeing this activity at some level. But we had a working group of meteorologists, planetary scientists, atmospheric chemists, cryospheric scientists, and there were two people, as far as I can tell, who'd thought about the biosphere at all. One is Jim Hansen, who at least eventually thought a lot about it. I don't know if he was thinking about it then. And Vince Salomonson. Okay, he was on one of the supporting working groups. Other than that, the place was devoid of people. They're all smart people, and it was a classic NASA um, opportunity. Um, in 1979, they began the AgriStars Lacey program that, that, um, that uh, Forrest mentioned, and this was an applications program. It was a totally different directorate within NASA. We had, Earth, we had science, and we had applications. They were completely separate things. And there was no significant interaction that I know of, maybe Forrest knows of some, but I certainly didn't see any interaction with the science side of the house, okay? Well, this program, this green document, served as kind of a document for how NASA looked at things for quite a few years, and, and they identified key missions, research priorities, and they actually followed it pretty well. It's a pretty damn good outline of where, where we went over the next uh, decade. The atmospheric chemistry program wasn't really included in that, and it kind of developed a little bit separately and magnificently under Shelby Tilford. And then the AgriStars program collapsed. It went from 35 million a year to 5 million a year. And as it was collapsing, Shelby Tilford eventually ended up in control of the remnants of the budget and the old applications program. Everything came under his domain. And at that point, my last bullet here, the search for scientific relevance began. Okay, those of us like Forrest who were doing stuff, they started to say, what is this? And at Goddard, we mounted an effort to try to define a role for us in the climate program and, and, uh, and so on. Some tidbits from this plan, though, uh, 1977 plan, and, and the, you know, these are platitudes you get in there, and they look pretty good, 
except you realize that they are like half a percent of the recommendations and insights, and they were accepted, I suspect, with great reluctance. But we need an improved understanding of the biosphere, atmosphere, ocean interaction to permit reliable predictions of man's impact on the atmosphere. The size of the biomass, measured in terms of carbon, should be determined to a factor of two. Have we got that yet, do you think? Well, it should be, okay. Observations to define relative changes to 1% per year. <laughs> okay, highly desirable. Well, highly desirable is code word for, don't pay much attention to this, but at least we, we, we showed we're listening to you guys, okay? And one of the tasks should be to find an improved specification of the observational requirements, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Evapotranspiration, wow! And plant water stress measurements are needed. And there is the NASA L-band plug where you must have an L-band radiometer. Vincent was doing his work there. And they said, it appears that plant stress, they had no idea what it was, but it appears it may be something you can measure. We need albedo and they 50 kilometer scale, 0.03. Landsat is good enough for this. Okay, good. Okay, we're paying attention, you guys, and go, now go away. And so on. So that, those were the kind of ideas being expressed. So, in 1977, oh, by the way, uh, Piers, where were you in 1976, 77? You were in college, right? right? Yeah. Were you drunk or sober? No. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, okay, this was, and this really governed our plan for many years. Pierce was in college, okay? Uh, There's no such thing as a vegetation index then, uh, but that document did call out for the second or the fourth IR, uh, band in, in AVHRR that allowed the vegetation index to be done. That was actually promoted there. So, and there were a few intrepid souls, Vince and Jim Hansen and Rasul, who got a bit of stuff in there. That was good. The assessments were hopelessly optimistic, but none of them were unreasonably pessimistic. The budget for land atmospheres, I said, fallen from 35 million to 5 million, and the community had been largely dispersed. 10 years later, 10 years, guys, 10 years later, we were doing Fife and Boreas. This is incredible, okay? There was nothing, there was a budget that was one-fifth of what it was and it was doing something else to begin with. This is amazing, okay? And you guys are part of how that happened, a big part. How did we get there? Okay, in the early 70s, Jim Tucker of NASA started doing this global vegetation mapping and that kind of set a train. We had endless arguments in international meetings. What does it mean? And uh, Gossam did some really, Gossam Oswald did some really nice work, and then Pierce wrote the paper that people finally listened to that explained what it meant, and we started roaring. We established scientific basis, not statistics, not correlation, but a scientific basis for what the damn thing meant. Okay? In 1981, it gets personal, I temporarily left NASA headquarters. I was in planetary, and I went out to Goddard, and it be proved to be a, a career change, okay? I never came back. Uh, I never came back to uh, Planetary. The Earth Resources Branch, uh, which is now headed by, was headed for John, by John Ranson, Darrell Williams, and, and I don't know who, who's running it now? Jeff Mason. Jeff Mason, okay. It's a lab. It's a lab. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, I, I came out there as the branch head, uh, a guy who knew all about planets and nothing about plants. And... Um, <laughs> We had an incredibly bright crew, and I'm just enormously proud of this group because you guys were the nucleus of how we made this program grow. Uh, entirely bright bunch of people, and a number of them are still in the room, uh, but NASA's program was built around the hammer approach, and here we were doing something, and I kept thinking, we've got to get ourselves justified to continue, and I know this stuff is good, but I don't really know where to go with it, and I didn't particularly remember the green book. Young Pierce Sellers arrived as a postdoc with an ambitious plans to use his SIB and global models and ideas about field experiments. And unlike Forrest, I do remember our first meeting. And there's even a story. I think, I think that Jerry Soffin and, and Yale Mint slipped you in the back door. I don't think you were admitted by the proper process. But uh, <laughs> as we tried to control that process from headquarters, and I don't think we let you in. That's a lesson. So, then a really neat thing happened in 1983. Rasul, remember him, 
and Hans-Jürgen Bola proposed a linkage between the bio land biosphere and the climate system. And they proposed what we call Iselskip, or the French say Iselskip. And they can, say that, they can say that faster than we can say Iselskip. You know. <laughs> the key idea, linking the land biosphere in terms of its relevance to the climate program. This, this was like the Rosetta Stone. When I got this invitation and saw the ideas to be discussed, wow! This is a way, science actually works when you do really good stuff and you can put it in a context that makes it important. You know how to judge priorities. And, and the basic idea is we were looking for something like 10 watts per square meter. And if your biology worked at 10 watts per square meter at a GCM grid scale, you're important. If it doesn't, you're not. That's, that's, that's not a bad way to go. Or you can argue 10, 20, 30, whatever. So that gave us a context for what we were doing. I said, wow, this is fantastic. I first met Sharon Nicholson at that meeting and a number of other people that uh, Rasool assembled. So we got there, and uh, Istiak really is the godfather of all of this stuff that you have here. He's the man at the top, program inside, and kind of said, ooh, let there be this. And uh, many people contributed. I don't want to focus too much, but Piers really was the intellectual spark plug behind this that made it real. I mean, it was a good idea, and I'm smart enough to say, wow, that's good, that's cool. I wonder how we do it, okay. Well, so we began to do that, but we had no power, no budget, and a disinterested program manager, an engineer. Remember Mike Calabrese? Any people? Okay. Okay. Uh, and the, the, the one good thing we had going for us is I think he was afraid of me because he suspected I might be coming back to headquarters as his boss. That's about the only thing we had going. You were talking earlier about how do we keep these things going. Well, you have, part of what I'm talking about here, you have to have a context of management that is interested and can get money, is willing to get you money, and understands what you're doing. And if you don't have that, you know, Pierce could have come here and maybe become an astronaut, but if, if, if the line had gone to Mike Calabrese and if there had been no Jim Tucker at Goddard and all that effort, it would have been, you know, there was this Brit guy came in. He was kind of funny, you know, good fun. I wonder what happened to him. Okay? You need it all. You need the context. You need the ideas. You need the doability. And we had it. So, okay. So Rasul found money for Piers and me to uh, go charging off to Hamburg to unite the plans with the Europeans. Uh, he'd had a workshop over there in Innsbruck. And there was this wonderful moment after the workshop and Piers and Francois Becker and I went back to our hotel and talked ideas. Well, they were talking boundary layers and fluxes and, and fortunately they spoke in French about half the time and so I could, I had a legitimate excuse for not knowing what they were talking about. Okay. <laughs> But I, I, my sense, and Piers can correct me, but I, th I felt like this was the, the solid, the, the person, you, you finally had somebody who really understood what you had, and you could sharpen your ideas against him. Okay, the, and, and that's where we began to evolve this program. So Piers and I bypassed our headquarters weenie, and we went and uh, talked to Shelby Tilford, and he gave us $15,000. And we held our first workshop, and the rest is history. Okay, try and running out of time, so I've got to speed along here. So, some other things. Uh, with the final collapse of AgriStars, uh, we had a chance to bring some people from JSC. My number one draft pick, Forrest Hall. Ta-da! Thank heavens he came. Again, this would not have happened without Forrest. Okay, the, the, and the, the Wonder Twins. Uh, my word, what a, what a duo, the dynamic duo. Uh, out there doing these things. If Forrest hadn't come, I don't know how we would have done this. So it's about people. It's about individual people. It's about big ideas. It's about program managers. It's individual people. And about that time, I, I went back to headquarters, indeed, and uh, I recruited Diane Wickland to come. Now, some people would say she was one of the few women there, but I would say she was the only ecologist we'd ever seen. <laughs> and uh, so, but Diane, I'd say, the best hiring job I ever did. Again, these things would not have happened without her. Fife would have, Boreas wouldn't have. So, uh, finding more people. Finding the other person I needed, a hydrology and remote sensing science manager, took a little longer. Sam Goward came and helped out part-time. Jeff Dozier, did you know he used to be a headquarters weenie? Jeff Dozier? <laughs> 
And Jeff was only marginally involved with NASA at that time, I think, more NOAA, and I th I, he probably had ulterior motives, but uh, without his coming and, and getting through these critical stages, it would not have happened. And then Sharon Nicholson came, and uh, she basically did all the work for the peer review. She ran the peer review stuff for me. I, I you know, did the formal things. And she talked me through some of the things, like, now you got to do this, this is good, and let me explain to you what an eddy flux you know, is. Now. So, so these people all made it work. Okay? It took a little longer, finally, to get Gossam there. And at first, Gossam came and took that job permanently. And I, first, I turned him down. Okay, because I thought he belonged out in the field doing real, real stuff. Okay, I got a rip. I'm really, I'm overdue. So, a uh, whole bunch of things happened. How many people were in, in the Hapex Mobile experiment? One, two, three. Okay, how many people were in Fife? And uh, and how about Boreas? Oh, in between Hapex, Hapex uh, Mobile. Did I say that? Hapex. Yeah, I did. Uh, Kursk, Kursk 89. Steve, I know. Uh, Hapex Sahel. Okay. So we had this whole nice string of things. Boreas, well, everybody, you know, okay. LBA and whatever. So good things happened out of all this. I want to put a cap on it and say the proof is in the pudding. Okay. And as a, as a science manager and, and looking for how do you judge things and how you say, did we do a good job? Well, I, I think actually Dave Schimmel summed it up and a number of you said, you know, we've got a community. Okay, that's, you, a number of you said that, you feel it, and I see that too. But I took a, I like the metric of the EOS interdisciplinary scientists. We had no program in the land in 1985 or 83, something like that, whatever it was. And by the time we selected the IDS scientists, one quarter of the IDS teams were land biosphere people, okay? And uh, if I got the list right, Joe Selar was involved in these activities, uh, Jeff Dozier, I caught Bob Dickinson because he, he was one of the good guys. He wasn't a land guy, but he was one of our guys. Jan Kerr, Barry and Moore was not involved in this stuff. Dave Schimmel, Dave Schimmel came to the program through Fife and Boreas. Peers. So this program drew in the people and formed the community. So did it change the world? You bet. Great scientific advances. Many scientific findings have been brought into practical use, and this community that did not exist now exists and is vibrant. So I say thank you, Istiak Rasul. Thank you, even Hans Bola, as much trouble as we had with him. Thank you, Sharon and Jeff and Sam and Forrest and Piers and Diane and Gossam, all you guys in the management an intellectual spark plug side. Thank you. You guys made something wonderful, and I am just as proud as could be to have been a part of it. <laughs>